Hello, all. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are going to be having a wonderful session brought to you by our generous supporters of the Gerald Huff Fund for Humanity, Humanity Forward, and APIC Study. My name is Kimberly Woods. I'll be moderating today uh, with these wonderful women at this amazing panel. Thank you so much for joining us. We do have one speaker still coming up to us, so I'll bring her up as soon as she gets here. So Ruby, just get on in here as soon as you can. All righty. So before we begin, I'd like to just briefly do a quick overview about Crowdcast. If you would like to submit a question to the speakers, please post it in the Ask a Question section down below. You may also vote on questions that have been posted already by other attendees. This will help us understand what's most of interest among all of you. Um, next, there is a chat box where you can see that on the side. I've already seen people contribute to that. Um, please just use that as much as you'd like converse please at this moment introduce yourself share your pronouns where you're coming to us from we'd love to understand about our audience and and just greet you fully thank you so much for joining us so real quickly i want to do oh i'm seeing ruby here so let me do a quick find her here Okay, Ruby, I am not, oh, hold on. One second, please. It's saying that you're not live. Can you please for screen, please? That would be really helpful. Okay. As we um, bring her up, I'm just going to um, get on with getting on introduced. Um, so we first have Maria Wong. She is a um, public speak, uh, public health student with a background of working in transition house supporting women who experience violence and working with anti-poverty groups. Maria graduated with a BA in public health with distinction from the University of Victoria with a um, with placement supervised by uh, Dr. Evelyn Forger at the University of Manitoba and conducted this review and will be presenting their paper, Basic Income and Violence Against Women. Thank you so much, for, uh, Maria, for joining us today. Next up, I have here with us Megan um, ma, 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 oh, I'm butchering it. I'm, you just told me. <laughs> and I'm so, so sorry for that. Yeah. Megan um, has, a collective, has been a collective member of Vancouver Rape Relief and Women and Women's Shelter. Um, pardon me. Um, since 2019, in this role, she worked with battered women and women um, victims of sexual violence, providing them with safety, emotional support, and advocacy with state institutions. Thank you so much, Megan, for joining us today. Um, Sarah Ma has, is a third-generation uh, Canadian-born Chinese woman raised in Vancouver, Canada. She is a member of the Asian Women for Equity and currently lives in Montreal, Canada. Thank you so much for joining us. Jacqueline is at Jax, uh, as she goes by, um, is a radical feminist lesbian active for 20 years in the Canadian women's movement. She has organized direct actions like Take Back the Night, 
responded directly to over 1,500 women callers to a rape crisis line, built robust political coalitions, participated in legal reform campaigns, and played in a feminist punk rock band where whose uh, politics were too radical for some and just right for many. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. All right, and Ruby, let me just come over here and see if I can't bring you up now. Oh, here we go. Yes. So as she's coming up, I just sent you that invite, Ruby. So Ruby um, is here from Turtle Clan from Plains of Saskatchewan. She is an Indigenous activist, union member, mother, sister, auntie, grandmother, and lifelong learner. Ruby is a member of the um, uh, Aboriginal Women's Action Network with Center on Exposing and Ending Male Violence Against Indigenous Women, Building Feminist con Consciousness, and Reclaiming Indigenous Women's Place in Society. All right, Ruby, let's see if you can make it up. We would love to have you. Okay, so thank you so much everyone for joining us. We are going to get started. Um, I have a couple of questions and we are um, gonna just take a moment to have everyone say hello, if you guys would all like to just greet everyone. Megan, why don't you- um, If you don't mind, yeah. There's some There's kind of some drama, drama with us, a massive, massive echo, echo, I think. Eh? Are we getting an echo? Quite a lot of uh, echo. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Did it stop now? Seems to have stopped. Might be me. Might be me. Okay. If it stopped, it stopped. The only reason I wanted to go first was because I prepared to acknowledge the stolen land I'm coming from. So, uh, what well, a Jacqueline squeezed and Kuntal Kelowna. Hi, my name is Jacqueline. And I'm coming from Kelowna, BC, renamed Kelowna, BC, which is the unceded and currently still occupied territory of the Silk people. And some of our colleagues are joining us today from the likewise unceded and currently still occupied territories of the the Tsleil-Waututh, um, Salish, and I'm not sure where else I'll ask others to acknowledge whose traditional territories they're joining from. I'm I'm coming from the Lekwungen territories in Victoria, BC. Um, I'm speaking to you from Montreal, and I'll acknowledge um, that I'm um, coming from unceded Indigenous lands of the Guinean Geaga Nation, also known as the Mohawk. And I'm coming from the unceded territory of the Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh people. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for introducing yourself. We're hoping that Ruby can rejoin us um, when we, um, if she can just refresh her screen, we can re-invite her. Um, thank you so much. So the BC's Women's Alliance is an impressive coalition where each of you are doing work to address really important needs for women. We'd love to hear a little bit more about the work each of you are doing. Um, with that, the the coalition is so impressive. Can you tell us more about the goals of the alliance? Can you tell us about the direct actions taken this year and any full uh, future plan actions? We'd love to hear about it. Uh, crew, do you mind if I begin? Except maybe this terrible echo will kill us all. Please, please begin, Jax. Okay. Um, 
So if you don't mind, I'll share my screen and I can, oops, I can say that um, I'm going to speak a little bit about how the BC Women's Alliance began in the midst of the pandemic and our goals, some of our actions, a tiny bit about why GLI is a lesbian issue, and then I'll make sure that all the rest should be able to answer too. Does that sound okay? Is that cool? Anyone, if anyone disagrees, it's also no problem. But now I'm looking around trying to share my screen, and I thought I could, but... You're, you're going to hover over your own image, and, and then you should have a little... Um, little wheel next to and then next to the wheel is a little computer icon and you'll hit that button okay 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 I need to hit that button too to stop this holy This is thrilling. Uh, there's an IT problem that prevents me from sharing my screen. I'm going to chuck our website into the chat. And then anybody who wants to see what our website looks like can take a look. Perfect. I don't know why I can't share my screen. It got into some nonsense about my computer monitor or my um, camera. So I don't know what's going on. So we're the BC Women's Old. Sure. Yeah, sounds good. Would you like me to pull it up? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we yeah, saw it there for a second. There we go. So we're the BC Women's Alliance. We formed in the early part of... It's really terrible. I can't. I'm reluctant, I'm reluctant to continue, to continue because every time I speak, I hear this I terrible, hear this terrible echo. echo. Does it not harm everybody else's ears? ears? It's not as sharp as it was like a few minutes ago. <laughs> it, it's kind of okay. And sometimes it's not echoey. Like right now, it doesn't appear echoey. That's terrible. That's terrible. That's terrible. No, it's me. It's me. It's me. Okay, it's so me. make it's someone, someone else, else explain, explain us, huh? And I'll stop this nonsense, nonsense and, try and, and try to come back. back. Is that okay? Is that okay? Is that okay? Is that okay? Oh, just let me ask. Yeah, make, sure, make sure you're closing all your windows, all your browser windows, because if you open this before, that might be where the feedback's coming from. It might be live in another window. Yeah. All right. So can I refresh everyone's mind about the question, and then we maybe we can hear from someone else? Perfect. All right. So... There we go. Oh, and she's back already. I think I might have solved it. I think I think so. Uh, in my day job, I work at a software company, so it should be easy for me to solve this nonsense. Okay, okay. let me tell you about the BC Women's Alliance. We're a group of feminist uh, organizations. We're open to also having individual women join us, but for now we are a group of groups based in the province of British Columbia. And we formed in 2020 when women who knew each other got together to think about what are we going to do about the effect on women of the pandemic and the threats to women of austerity in the so-called pandemic recovery plans that we could easily anticipate. So I'm sure some of those topics have popped up in other workshops and sessions in the conference. Um, so our group is primarily a feminist group. We have as our base agreements that our goal is women's freedom and that we are want to struggle against the enforcement of scarcity, the destruction of fundamental human and natural relationships and male violence against women, uh, including incest, rape, wife battering, prostitution, pornography, and that any pandemic recovery would have to end, or any would have to include ending all those practices. So because we agreed that uh, the effect of women's oppression on the basis of, Rex, of sorry, sex, race, and class were magnified during the pandemic, 
and that the destructive forces working against us were likewise very um, impactful on women, especially working class, poor and racialized and indigenous women, we decided to fight against the global neoliberal value system and for a life-sustaining culture. And the most obvious campaign for us to tackle was guaranteed livable income. And so our goal is really massive social transformation. Um, and our short-term tactics have been feminist campaigns for guaranteed income. And uh, we root our struggle for guaranteed income in feminist thinking that's been alive in Canada since the early 2000s. Uh, I was a member of two groups in 2003, Vancouver Rape Relief and the Canadian Association of uh, Sexual Assault Centers, who joined with other feminists to make a feminist statement on uh, women's economic equality. It's called the Pick Two Statement, and you can find it on our BC Women's Alliance website. And so we went back to those principles to ground our campaign. And we committed to doing two things, uh, in-person action, which was a very big challenge to do during the pandemic. Um, and build a coalition. So we live in a huge province. It's like about as big as California. So picture trying to organize in person in the pandemic. So we, uh, we decided to do an action on May Day, and we've now done that twice, where we ask women in the centers around the province to make a banner on the theme, Women Demand Guaranteed Livable Income and to display that banner in a public place and secure local uh, coverage in their local press. And we were really successful with that. We've mobilized around 60 women in groups of twos and threes and fours out in uh, now about 25 cities and towns split over the two years. and. I can't tell if you're still sharing the screen, but if you are, you scroll down on the homepage and you can see pictures of the banners, which are just beautiful. If anybody's looking at the website, the, the one in Prince George is a logging community. And so their town symbol is Mr. PG. You can see the banner with Mr. PG and then, uh, you have a group of women in Victoria in front of a big colonial hotel. The women in Nelson, BC, another kind of logging community and uh, a historical center of colonial injustice, meaning this is the local courthouse. Uh, women on the islands, uh, several highways, me with COVID dropping the banner by myself over the four lane highway in my town and a little picture of the um, the banner at a one-stop shop for tea, postage, and paper in an island community. So really happy that we managed to mobilize women and we secured a ton of media coverage. I managed as our speaker to be on the radio program that's listened to the most of anyone in our province, five million listeners. So we really feel like we've made a dent and helped contribute to the public dialogue on guaranteed income in uh, Canada. And I know in the conference, there's been a couple of other uh, sessions where you've heard a bit about the Canadian context. So since feminists have been working on guaranteed income since 2002, three, we believe we've had some influence on the legislators and we believe our uh, banner action here is going to help regular people understand that women want our share of the common good and that um, guaranteed income benefits all communities. Uh, finally, uh, I'm a member of the Vancouver Lesbian Collective. And so we use the opportunity to think together and express how and why guaranteed income is a lesbian issue and why we choose to include that in our campaigns. And for us, it's um, 
a few simple reasons. We lesbians don't have access to men's income. We don't want to be subject to sexual harassment and discrimination at work, same as any other woman. And we are feminists, so we want all women to have the freedom to choose their sexual and bodily uh, boundaries. We, like other women, have a ton of social and caretaking roles. And we think that with a guaranteed income, uh, people are free to do political organizing in ways that they aren't when they're tied down by many uh, part-time jobs or demands of jobs that constrict their lives so much. And so that would enable women to pursue lesbianism. And I really hope you can understand what I'm saying. I heard some of this nasty echo the whole time, but anyway, that's it. And I hope my colleagues will say a bit more and that we'll have a lively discussion. Thank you so much for sharing. I am very um, impressed with all of the activism that you guys have been up to for the last few years. That is definitely some really great stuff. Um, does anyone want to add to what she's been speaking to? So initially we were hoping uh, that Ru Ruby could uh, say a few things at this point, but hopefully um, when she joins in, she can add a little bit more. Uh, I um, am coming from frontline work and would like to uh, speak to um, the, women's, uh, the women that we work with and what guaranteed livable income would mean for them. Uh, but firstly, what I would really like to say before I start is that I feel so much solidarity right now with uh, women in America. As a feminist, I advocate for the liberation of all women, regardless of age, race, class, and country. And um, what we saw yesterday, restricting abortion is an attack on women's freedoms and we uh, freedom to make their own choices and dictate their lives and giving people the freedom to choose and, and dictate what happens with their lives is part of what guaranteed livable income is all about. Um, and so uh, I, I would like to talk about how women have the most to gain from guaranteed level income. We know that women's economic position is distinctly shaped by individual and systemic misogyny towards women that disadvantages us in so many ways. Um, and has, as you've um, you'll hear from uh, Maria and from the other panelists, poverty has a huge impact on women's lives. And through my work on the crisis line and in the transition house uh, where we house women and their children um, escaping male violence, I see firsthand how poverty acts to restrict and limit women's abilities to live healthy, comfortable lives safe from, uh, safe from violence. In, uh, in 2021, a rape relief gathered um, a whole bunch of ex-residents and callers in a consultation pro process to create recommendations for uh, ending male violence against women. Um, women spoke to the conditions of their lives and um, I'll be using a couple quotes from the consultation to demonstrate how poverty influences women's lives. Uh, out of this project, we created 45 feminist demands to end male violence against women and the set of uh, legal policy social demands offer a really comprehensive roadmap to stopping uh, the crisis that is male violence against women. Uh, one woman told us in the consultation, uh, poverty gives men so much power. I know so many women who have had to go back to their abuser because of that. If they can't work or they have a disability, it just becomes a really big problem for you because you cannot afford it. The threat of poverty forces women to tolerate male violence. And we consistently hear that women are hesitant and choose not to leave violent men because they're unsure whether or not they can provide for themselves and their children alone. Uh, so many, as uh, Jax was saying, um, without the uh, access to uh, men's financial advantage, um, it's a disadvantage for women. Uh, poverty also increases the vulnerability of women to, um, to, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. <laughs> 
I am just rooting. Yay, Ruby's here. We're all here. Keep, keep, oh, keep great. Hi, Ruby. I'm sure Ruby will want to hop in. Yeah. Hey. Um, I uh, was just saying how, um, yeah, poverty increases women's vulnerability to violence and uh, women are left with fewer options to fight back and resist the, the violence that they experience. Um, because when you're, if you're forced to choose between speaking up about your boss harassing you and potentially losing your job or still being able to put out food on the table for your kids, um, that's a decision that sometimes women are forced to make. Um, women in poverty are also forced to choose um, which basic necessities they're going to meet, uh, whether that's food or housing or clothing or utilities or medication. Uh, one woman in the consultation uh, process told us, when you were on welfare, after you buy groceries, there's basically nothing left. You just have to survive and not really be able to live. It's just survival. Uh, so part of GLI is not just providing the basics for survival, but providing enough so that women have discretionary, discretionary spending money to allow them to fully participate uh, in their communities. Um, what we also hear time and again is uh, women we work with, they tell us that they enter into prostitution as a last resort for putting food on the table and keeping the roof over their head. Uh, women's impoverishment is exploited by men to gain sexual access to women. Uh, and prostitution stems from uh, men feeling entitled to women's bodies and having the economic advantage, while women are at the economic disadvantage and have little other options to choose from. Um, I'd also like to note that um, the unpaid labor done by women, which includes homemaking and raising children, caring for the elderly, is work that is often unpaid and really uh, not recognized or valued enough in society. Uh, the pandemic has exacerbated pre-existing inequalities of race and class and sex. Um, and uh, we, we see this more and more um, every day. Uh, the report Unmasking Gender Identity um, or Gender Inequality identified that women lost 60% more jobs than uh, men uh, and were often employed in industries that were most affected in, by the pandemic. Uh, and um, to, when, what we see within the last week, within the last month, within the last year is that the women that call our crisis line and the women we're connected with have never asked so frequently for help with basic necessities like groceries. Um, so many women have called us this year, reconnected with us to ask for help just buying food. The cost of inflation is so high at the moment. So women's main requests for physical help sent around providing those basic necessities for themselves and their families that aren't currently um, met by their income or the state. Um, so uh, the, the other point that I want to mention about GLI specifically, uh, guaranteed livable income, is the point that it should be unconditional. And this is important because the, the ever-present influence of, of patriarchy manifests in this paternalistic state, which reg regulates and dictates how uh, individuals can spend the money that's given to them. Guaranteed livable income should be unconditional without a test or job search requirements or li limitations on expenditures. Um, we were happy to see earlier this year that the Committee for the Status of Women in Canada accepted our submission and call for GLI uh, and recognized that violence against women is a, di a direct result of social construction of masculinity that manifests in men's entitlement and control over women's bodies. Um, and so I, I, I hope it's clear that women are in, it's really clear to us on the front lines, uh, that women are in desperate need of unconditional income that will meet their basic needs for nutritious food, safe and stable housing, uh, transportation for freedom of movement, and some for discretionary spending. And economic independence is so key to women's equality uh, and liberty and guaranteed livable income is a really concrete way uh, to increase women's control over their own lives. It really is. That's so poignant of you to point out. I am um, very, very glad that you've brought the um, information as well on, uh, thank you, Jax, for posting the link to that. Um, I do want to um, pass it over to the Alliance and just 
see if there's anything that uh, you'd like to add as well. Okay. Um, so there's another, um, I also want to mention because of these tech issues, we'll go a little bit long. We want to make sure we have time for everyone's questions for follow-up questions and all of, all of that. Um, there's um, a really great question here around um, autonomy as well. So from uh, your findings, um, Maria, in your paper, what do you believe an unconditional and universal basic income program or policy would be more beneficial to women's safety and economic and uh, autonomy? Um, I had a bit of a presentation prepared, but I'm wondering if um, the Alliance wants to just finish up uh, or uh, yeah. continue the conversation. I would be happy to share what I think about those principles and it's definitely yeah. in my presentation, but I will, I'll leave it for the Alliance okay. to continue this conversation first. Okay. That's okay. okay. Can we maybe have Ruby go? Yes. Yes. Um, next, mm -hmm. as one of the representatives of the Alliance and of, as the Aboriginal Women's Action Excellent. Network. Excellent. Thank you. I'm I'm so glad that I was able to finally join. I've I've heard some of what's been said, so I'll just try and catch up right now, um, and I'll. I'll I'll sh I'll read what you I prepared. I'm nervous if, in case you can't tell. Okay. I thank the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people for allowing me to be a visitor on their traditional territory, which is now called Vancouver, BC. I acknowledge that their territory was taken and not ceded by treaty. Stating that this stating this is one action that I take to show my gratitude and respect for them and their traditional lands. I'm fortunate to be a member of Aboriginal Women's Action Network. My name is Ruby Langan, and I am an Anishinaabe woman from the plains of Turtle Island within what is what now called Saskatchewan, Canada. I'd like to share my perspective on the basic income guarantee as an Indigenous woman and as a member of Aboriginal Women's Action Network. As a person speaking from an Indigenous woman's perspective, I should address racism and sexism. These two prejudices are the challenges, um, which I'm fairly new to the terminology, but not with the experiences. I realized this when a well-meaning person asked me why we needed uh, murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls inquiry. And the reason or the revelation that came to me is that an inquiry into a murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls is needed because they're murdered and in, and missing, because they're Indigenous and they're women. I'd also like to note that racism and sexism against Indigenous women has its roots in patriarchy and colonialism. You may have heard that uh, Indigenous people live higher rates of poverty, homelessness, prostitution, illness, mortality, suicide, violence, drug addiction, child apprehension, incarceration, employment. Perhaps you've heard the statistics and guidance from the censuses, uh, the inquiries, the Royal Commission, the United Nations reports. These challenges are not new and there's a lot of guidance, suggestions and solutions available. A basic income guarantee would go far to address these issues because many of them are rooted in poverty. A basic income guarantee would help many Indigenous women stay out of survival prostitution, uh, flee male violence, um, and move from poverty survival mode to addressing their other needs, such as their health and reclaiming their strength in Indigenous society. Um, on a more personal note, um, to state this uh, from a more personal perspective, Indigenous women are deeply affected by poverty, requiring us to resort to desperate measures such as prostitution in order to provide for our basic needs and for drug relief to escape from the desperate circumstances that have been foisted upon us 
such as patriarchy and colonialism, sexism, racism. Another reason of this assistance is needed is so we can provide collective assistance to create community as is our traditional manner. The relief of poverty and creation of community would be the beginning of healthy Indigenous women and Indigenous communities. To disrupt the current painful Indigenous trajectory to surviving through Canadian government institutions, government institutions such as residential schools, foster care, homelessness, prostitution and jails. Maybe homelessness and prostitution are not perceived as institutions, but there are many service providers who are supported by funding from government to keep us where we are rather than help us out of poverty, homelessness, prostitution, and their term poverty pimps. In case you haven't heard the term, that's, that's where it comes from. Aboriginal Women's Action Network is an independent voice for Indigenous women. So we get to speak our truth. An Indigenous woman who's receiving a basic income guarantee will have her poverty needs addressed and we will be able to fight the violent sexism and racism in her community. We need a basic income guarantee. All my relations. Thank you so much, Ruby, for your words. Very, very important and poignant and, and incredibly true for women to have full choice and and to be able to really move throughout this world and thrive, we need economic security and, and it is so important. Thank you so much for your words. Um, I know we have also Sarah um, from the Women's Alliance. Is there anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, I think I'll talk quickly a little bit um, uh, about some of our work as Asian Women for Equality. Um, as a member of the Alliance and um, just before um, Maria Wong goes uh, with her research mm -hmm. project. Um, so I'm just gonna try and um, share my screen again. Uh oh, it says too many videos. Oh, okay, that's okay. I don't have to share the screen. I've um, got a full house here. Is there a way you can share a link? I know, well, that's a very good. Um, no, it, 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 but that's okay. I, I'll, I'll share the uh, link to my organization um, um, website afterwards. Um, but basically, I'm here representing Asian Women for Equality. Um, we're a Canadian feminist group based in Vancouver. Um, members of our group, the BC Women's Alliance, and this panel have the frontline experience to know that promoting equality, that sexual equality and racial equality, um, and um, as Megan said, has to address women's poverty in some way. Um, and we've actually held the position that Canada has an obligation to offer women viable pathways towards economic security. Um, so that male violence and inequality isn't something we have to accept. Um, so we've actually been speaking in support of basic income as an important element of achieving women's um, economic security for many years. But we actually first began engaging with basic income advocates in 2014 at the International Basic Income Earth Network Conference. And later on, we also um, attended a North American Basic Income Guarantee Conference. Um, but at the time and as we went along, we saw that there were key voices that were underrepresented or um, entirely missing from the conversation. Um, we know that the overwhelming reality is that very often women and women of color are left out of democratic, democratic processes and we've historically been excluded from social policy. Women make up an overwhelming proportion of the poor we end up getting pushed to the margins of society. Um, our labor and even our bodies are used to drive so-called economic development. And you know, as um, you know, as both Megan and Jax and, and Ruby have described, our work often goes under unacknowledged. Um, we're underpaid, we're completely unpaid. We're often responsible for care work, child care, child bearing. But it's many women of color and migrant women that are engaged in those low wage, often exploitive jobs or we're just simply used and exploited as is the case um, for trafficking and prostitution. So some basic income is often just, like, since basic income, it's often justified in part on its potential um, to benefit specifically women, um, racialized people and poor people. We only, we think it's only fair that we have our place um, in this discussion at this policy table. 
Um, and we believe it's crucial that women uh, racialized and working class perspectives have a central position in these discussions. So we actually have a say about what these programs might look like and, and implement them in a way that actually serves the people um, they say that they're meant to be serving. So here we saw an opportunity to diversify also the perspectives on basic income as well as broaden the support, support base for it. So beginning in 2017, we began hosting a series of public discussion panels to create and grow dialogue in support of a guaranteed livable income. And our goal was to create a feminist platform for discussions around guaranteed livable income that bridge frontline organizations, grassroots activists, and academia together from different fields. We wanted to build alliances and, and share shared theory. Um, the panels, we hosted them in Canada, we hosted them abroad, one of them took place in Australia, um, and we also host them online. Over the last five years, we've had uh, around 300 attendees and connected with over 20 activists, individuals, and organizations. Um, our panelists have included grassroots organizations led by women, uh, indigenous women, women of color, immigrant women, um, but also wider um, environmental justice and sustainability activists, uh, renowned basic income researchers, advocates, politicians. And of course, you know, we're uh, very deeply tied uh, to, uh, as a member of the BC Women's Alliance. So we've seen growing support for basic income in light of this global pandemic that has exposed the weaknesses of the current economic system. Um, it's posed a serious health risk, it's threatened lots of our livelihoods, and it's really rendered those in long-term care homes, frontline jobs, healthcare professions, caretaking roles, disproportionately vulnerable. And many of the disproportionately vulnerable are women and women of color. So the women in our group, we continue to think about what guaranteed livable income means for a capitalist society, um, what it means in a world in which we're having to oppose constant movement towards privatization, um, this individualism that blames us for our own poverty. Um, we're also having these discussions during a time when we're being forced to reckon um, with the racism that's been a really key part of police brutality and, and incarceration of people of color, um, and the fact that poverty is central um, to that disproportionate criminalization of people of color, including women of color. So we feel more than ever that the influence, leadership, and endorsement of affected groups, such as women, such as racialized women and poor women, it's really vital to bring a fair and effective and equality promoting um, guaranteed livable income um, into reality. And we really look forward to working alongside other feminists toward that goal. So thanks, and I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on, I guess, to Maria. Thank you so much for your expert insight and, you know, implementation with the voices of those who are receiving is so important. So thank you so much for all your work. Maria. All right, let's try. Oh. Okay, I can't share my screen either asks the host to remove a source and try again. Maybe if I turn off my video, would that work? Like, and then try. I'm, I don't think yeah. if, if, Ooh. there we go. Okay, can everyone see this? I see a white screen. Oh. Okay, no. Uh, okay, great, got it. Um, okay, so uh, this was this uh, presentation will be on the review that I conducted for my practicum at the end of my public health degree under the direction of my supervisor, Dr. Evelyn Fourche, who, as you all know, is a leading expert on basic income and economist and professor in community health sciences. Uh, my literature search found 215 articles that were screened through to meet the criteria I was looking for. I wanted to find articles that report a direct association between cash transfers and violence against women, which resulted in 43 articles for this review. 
From these, there were 28 articles on intimate partner violence, which was described violence from within a marriage or romantic relationship. In this literature, intimate partner violence was described as aggressive, controlling, and coercive behavior, threats, psychological violence, emotional, physical, and sexual violence, intimate partner homicide, and hospitalizations due to violence. There were 15 articles examined in this review that I categorized under sexual exploitation. The term sexual exploitation was chosen to be the most relevant by encompassing many layers of unwanted sexual contact and the spectrum of violence against women, where the perpetrators were specifically not intimate partners. The literature describes indicators of sexual exploitation, which includes sexual assaults, sex trade intervention uh, interactions, which is trading sex for money or other valued things, age disparity, so this was about youth who had much older sexual partners, sexual harassment, and any other indicators of coerced or unwanted sexual contact. Some policymakers, including a member of the BC Basic Income Expert Panel, report a hesitation with implementing basic income based on cash transfer studies that report outcomes of increased intimate partner violence. For my review, I wanted to dig deeper into why this happens. Most studies in my review, 22 of the 28 reported that cash transfers were associated with a decrease in at least one form of violence, physical, sexual, or emotional violence. 17 of these articles reported a decline in physical violence, including homicides and hospitalizations due to violence. There were nine articles that reported either an increase or no significant change to emotional violence, despite many of the articles reporting a decrease in physical violence. Uh, qualitative studies explain that women's uh, most commonly reported increased violence in the form of threats, aggression, and manipulation from their husbands to gain control of the cash transfer. One such cash transfer program offered cell phone transfers with an authentic authentication process for women to manage their own money more discreetly while preventing their husbands from taking their cash. This process managed to prevent one man's attempt to impersonate his wife, and women described how their husbands used these emotional forms of violence to access the cash. Some articles suggest that when women's education, employment, or economic status is greater than their husbands, they have an increased risk of intimate partner violence. Cash transfers themselves did not cause increased violence, but rather it may invoke men's jealousy or perceived threat of women's raised economic status. Most of the cash transfer programs were not designed to address violence against women and designed for other purposes, such as improving child health. There are only three articles that reported the pairing of cash transfers with social programs that addressed violence in relationships. More than half of the articles examined were based on conditional cash transfers with conditions requiring parents to bring their children to health appointments and ensure school attendance. This was a barrier for women in rural areas, and it was often expected that women in the household would fulfill this duty. Some academics have argued that this reinforces existing gender roles and places an unequal burden on women to alleviate household poverty. Most articles, 23 of the 28, only sampled women from within intact relationships, but did not keep track of women leaving relationships. This is a major gap in this research as it's necessary to understand whether cash transfers designed in a certain way could aid women to leave violent relationships. Future research should consider this question. Most articles, 11 of the 15 on sexual exploitation, report that cash transfers can decrease women's vulnerability to sexual exploitation. One article reported that young women, some in adolescent ages, had chosen to decrease their reliance on older sexual partners due to cash transfers. Most articles that reported on the sex trade, nine out of the 11 articles, reported that cash transfers allowed women to decrease their sex trade interactions with men. There were five articles that asked women if cash transfers improved their autonomy to make sexual decisions. They all reported improvement. 
The main issue is that the general purpose of the 15 articles on cash transfer programs aim to reduce sexual risks and prevent HIV and not aim to prevent sexual exploitation. One article noted that women's sexual practices in romantic relationships did not change even though they were incentivized to reduce sexual risks. One main takeaway is that cash transfer seemed to improve women's sexual autonomy while at the same time aids women in choosing to decrease their interactions with men in the sex trade. There are a few main reasons that impact study outcomes. 10 articles involved young women and adolescent girls as participants. It is difficult to compare adolescent agency in using their income to adult women. Some cash transfer programs were directed to young women's parents or guardians rather than directly to the young women. And participants would report greater autonomy when they received the income themselves. In this section, the cash transfers were not very robust as they were short term with small cash amounts and were based on conditions with women that women had to perform. For example, some of the conditions required women to do STI screening in their health appointments, which again puts pressure and responsibility unfairly on women to solve a sexual health problem that the whole community faces. This does not acknowledge the sexual exploitation as an external force that has a greater impact on women. To reiterate, conditional cash transfers were often used to control women's behaviors, such as being entrenched in the caregiver role or being scrutinized for sexual risk behaviors, and are barriers for women in rural areas. Therefore, an unconditional basic income would be fairer and more accessible to women. In some articles, women reported the less robust cash transfers were often too small to make a significant difference for them. Basic income would need to be set at a livable amount to ensure women can leave violent relationships with men. Consistently, articles report that cash transfers were more likely to benefit women's autonomy if they had control over it themselves. Therefore, basic income would be best designed to be directed to all individuals to ensure women receive their own income. There's a potential in creating a basic income that accelerates women's liberation fight and to address the root causes of men's violence against women. Please take a look at my conference paper um, to, uh, to see all the citations and suggestions for future research and feel free to contact me. Thanks. Thank you so much, Maria. That was really inner, um, enlightening and full of so much data. Really appreciate that. Um, I think what strikes me is, um, you know, we have this uphill battle and it's really, it's really interesting that, you know, the U.S. is having the moment that we're in right now and you, you're talking about um, having the, the a, a basic income really needs to go to, to all women and, and get directly to them. I think that's really, really important. Um, when we talk about violence against women, we have to consider that if women aren't fully in control of their finances, then they are subject to being in situations that really don't work out. I'm going to bring Jacqueline back up on the stage and hopefully she can rejoin the conversation. Um, thank you so much. Um, would Maria, um, would, do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, yes, we do. Right on. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, Jax. All right. So I think this looks to be like a question here. Some Canadians have told me, a us -er, that U.S. citizens might need to fight for national health care first. Here in the U.S., we are going to see a mobilization in defense of abortion rights, but also privacy and LGBTQI rights in general. So I'm not sure there's a question in there. Um, does anyone want to respond to that as we wrap up? Um. I, I don't mind. The yeah. the BC Women's Alliance, I think, has a strategy that should make sense when you raise those kind of questions. It's a tactic, right? Pursuing a guaranteed income 
of the right sort is as a part of an integrated feminist struggle for social transformation and it can the the campaigning itself can be itself strategic like in our case my group works on um lesbian rights lesbian pride and sex-based rights other groups here focus from a perspective on indigenous women's autonomy violence against women anti-racist struggle for from perspective of women and we all managed to integrate the struggle for guaranteed income into those into those broader struggles yeah it's really true it's really true we do need to end it there. Um, we have about three minutes before our next session starts. So I wanna give everyone a chance to get over there. I wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our speakers. You all were amazing and so patient as we struggled through some technical <laughs> difficulties. Thank you to our audience for being so patient. Um, I really have just one housekeeping thing. Um, this recording will be available as soon as we end the broadcast and y'all can share it with your friends and family and all those amazing uh, advocates we know out there who need to hear some of the things that have, that have amazingly been said today. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you at the next session, y'all.